pleasure to introduce our uh, guest speaker today, Dr. Gord Boyd. Uh, so Dr. Boyd is an associate professor of neurology and critical care uh, at uh, Queen's, and uh, he's a clinician scientist who studies the acute and long-term neurological complications of critical illness, including those uh, patients who develop acute kidney injury requiring kidney replacement therapy. I'd also say that uh, Gord is widely known to be uh, a great mentor uh, and a great guy, and uh, and we're very lucky to have him here. I think uh, some of the work he's done, you know, we we often in nephrology will get paged for neurology sometimes, um, <laughs> and we're always happy to to uh, to send that call on. But I think you know, Gord as a neurologist has done such interesting work in nephrology that I think he's sort of developing this area which we need to call nephrology. So with that, uh, I'll let uh, I'll let Gord get started. Thanks. That's great, <clears throat> and uh, thanks so much for the uh, the introduction and the invitation to to come and speak to you. Um, for sure, like uh, if you've learned anything at the end of my talk, really, you know, brain, kidney, it's all the same stuff, and all the same pathology happens uh, in in both organs. It's just how it sort of manifests cl clinically is just slightly different. Um, I can just start off um, by acknowledging that the land that I, I work and live and play on uh, in the Kingston region is the uh, Haudenosaunee uh, and Anishinaabe uh, traditional lands uh, in Kingston. Uh, and I've got some disclosures as well. My program of research primarily looks at uh, cerebral oxygenation and its relationship with uh, delirium and long-term cognitive impairment and Edwards Life Sciences has kindly donated their cere cerebral oximeters to, to my program. I received some research funding from these groups. Uh, the work that I'm going to be talking about today was funded by a Department of Medicine Clinical Research Award. Uh, and as one of the other hats that I wear, I'm a regional medical lead for the Trillium Gift of Life uh, uh, Network. And of course, uh, I can't give a presentation without acknowledging my, my colleagues. Uh, you might see some familiar faces here. Uh, Rachel Holden, uh, Sam Silver, and uh, Khaled. Uh, Sam Shadi and they're all nephrologists here in, in, in Kingston that I collaborate with. Um, uh, Jessica Vanderlinden, she did her PhD with me and uh, defended her thesis a couple years ago and went on to do a postdoc with Chris McIntyre. Uh, Tasha Jawa, she's in the um, MD PhD program uh, here at Queen's and much of what I'm going to be talking about is, is her work as well. Uh, and Steve Scott, he's a neuroscientist and colleague of mine who invented this robot that helps quantify uh, the neurocognitive control of, of limb movement. So I'm going to be talking about uh, the work that I do with Steve. So the main objectives is really at the end of the talk to be able to describe the prevalence of cognitive impairment across the spectrum of kidney disease, to talk about the potential impact of visual, spatial, and executive dysfunction in patients with acute and chronic disease, uh, and talk about the possible pathophysiological mechanism, mechanisms underlying the progressive cognitive impairment in individuals with kidney disease. But if you fall asleep, because I know it's eight o'clock rounds and getting right before a long weekend, and if you... So this, this is my like, so what slide? Like, why is this important? And this is the underground uh, parking garage that I walk through almost every every day. Uh, and it's uh, uh, the parking lot uh, where all the patients go uh, uh, or park their cars before they go in for hemodialysis. So these are the specific uh, parking spaces uh, just uh, for the people with the special permits. And it's really interesting. So in this parking lot, like al almost all the cars are like dented and smashed up. Uh, so this is one of the trucks that's, that's parked there. And if you look actually at the post, the post is covered with like nicks and bangs and 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 scrape and and paint marks as well, uh, suggesting that maybe the patients who are on dialysis ha have some uh, visual spatial impairment. If you haven't thought about neurocognitive domains in, in a while, this is just a brief little reminder that there's six main neurocognitive domains. Uh, there's a perceptual motor uh, domain, which uh, we talked about, uh, which may have um, significant impacts on you, you know, driving and being able to navigate a map. There's the language domain, learning and memory, social cognition, complex attention, as well as executive functioning. So those are the, the main sort of neurocognitive domains when we think about uh, neurocognitive functioning. Uh, 
But I thought we'd uh, just quickly go over a, a little case example. This is Mr. Smith. He's a 78-year-old gentleman with a history of hypertension, diabetes, and a prior MI. He's got stage three uh, kidney disease. And he's had a rough go over the end of, you know, sort of the beginning of last year. Uh, lots of hospitalizations and eMERGE visits. In January 2022, he was admitted with orthostatic hypotension. Uh, a few weeks later, he came in with uh, hyperkalemia. A uh, few months later, came in with confusion and delirium, and then came in later with acute on chronic kidney disease, probably related to dehydration. He required a few runs of uh, dialysis in the uh, ICU. His kidney function returned back to baseline. And I, I run our ICU follow-up program uh, here in Kingston, so we saw him in clinic and try to ask him questions about how he's doing. He's like really vague in terms of his answers, asking him questions about what medications he's on. He defers entirely to to his, his wife, uh, not really sure what dietary restrictions uh, he might have. So the real question is like, what's actually going on with Mr. Smith? So a couple of questions. So first of all, how common is cognitive impairment to patients uh, with chronic kidney disease? And the second question is whether or not cognitive impairment is proportional to the stage of chronic kidney disease. Uh, and this is one of the first things that, that Jessica did as part of her, her PhD thesis. And it was actually the first systematic review I'd ever done. And if you've done systematic reviews, you always, you, you know, they're always way, way more work than, than, than what you ex expected. And this, this systematic review is no different. So, this uh, uh, systematic review, we really tried to be as all-encompassing as possible, looking at all different studies, uh, looking at any sort of you know cognitive assessment for patient uh, patients across any uh, degree of, of, of kidney impairment. Uh, so across this, we actually um, uh, uh, got data from almost, almost 50,000 patients, uh, people who were in the pre-dialysis uh, phase, patients who were on hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, patients who are on combined modalities. We also did a small number, found a small number of studies in looking at cognitive impairment post-transplant, uh, as well as some age and uh, sex match controls. So what we learned from this is that the vast majority of these studies on cognition and chronic kidney disease rely on dementia screening tools, such as a mini mental status exam. Uh, when you look at all of these, um, most of the weighted mean scores for chronic kidney disease were generally within the normal range. So uh, on the MMSC, that's more than 24. And we also found the patients with chronic uh, kidney disease, uh, hemodialysis or predialysis, generally perform worse on these tests compared to age, age match controls or patients post-transplant. Here's a little pop quiz for you. So this on the left is uh, your mini mental status exam. Uh, and on the right uh, is me in my green shirt. Uh, if you aren't aware, tomorrow is green shirt day. Um, any thoughts as to what these two things have in common? Feel free to unmute. And if it's too cumbersome to unmute, I can just tell you, uh, both of these things have been around since 1975. Um, so the mini mental status exam, it's a dementia screening tool. It takes about five to 10 minutes to complete. It's it was really designed to diagnose, uh, screen patients for Alzheimer's disease. So it's heavily weighted towards attention, language, and memory. And there's only one point on the MMSC allocated for perceptual motor, uh, uh, cognition. So when we looked at patients, uh, across the spectrum, uh, for their MMSC scores, we found that there's a significantly lower scores in the patient's pre-dialysis and the uh, hemodialysis population, uh, compared to controls. But you can see the majority of these scores are still above the cutoff here uh, of 24, which we, we consider a diagnosis of dementia. Getting out into some of the other tests we found, there's the trails making A and the trails making B test. The trails making A, really you're just, you know, um, going in between the, the circles here, connecting the, the, the numbers. Uh, this is a test of the perceptual motor and complex attention domains. The trails making B test uh, is a slightly different where you alternate between letters and numbers. Uh, so it brings in some executive uh, function as well. And what they do is they time how much time it actually takes to, to go through the trails A and trails B test. Uh, and again, compared to controls, the patients uh, with uh, uh, hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis tended to take longer to perform the trails making A. But surprisingly, there was no significant difference in the time that it took to do the trails making B test. So the third question is whether or not we can quantify the degree of neurocognitive dysfunction in patients with chronic kidney disease. Uh, 
And again, this is work that I did with uh, uh, Jessica Vanderlinden uh, in collaboration with Steve Scott. You can see this is actually our Kinarm robot in, in the back. Uh, and like I said, Steve invented the Kinarm uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, and he's really um, made a mark in terms of you know using robotic devices to quantify uh, cognitive function. Has done a lot of work uh, in the stroke and the MS populations, and just starting to look at patients with epilepsy and post cardiac surgery patients. Uh, and I have a whole cohort of my ICU survivors that this is how we assess their their cognition as well. This is just an example uh, of the some of the data that we get uh, out of the Kinarm robot. So this is the visually guided reaching task. And really, it's a fairly simple task. The, the light uh, shines and the uh, participant has to move basically the robotic arm uh, to get back to the dot. Again, it seems really simple and straightforward, but even in this simple task, we get a lot of really rich information, such as limb speed and reaction time. The limb position matching uh, task is an assessment of proprioception. So in this task, the robot is moving the patient's right arm uh, and they have to mirror match that, that movement with their left arm. The object hit and avoid task is a test of uh, visual spatial uh, function. Uh, and people actually really seem to enjoy this task. You know, the objects, they, they fall down from the screen and they have to bat them away. Some people get really, really worked up about this task. And we have a robotic version of both the trail A and the trail B task as well. So again, you can see the individual sort of going uh, alternating between numbers and letters. Um, so we not only get like total time on this, but we can quantify the amount of time that they spend on each target while they're searching around for other targets as well, something called the, the dwell time. Uh, the spatial span task is an assessment of working memory. So they will be shown a, a series of lights in the boxes and they'll have to remember um, the order and, and the number of the boxes uh, that came up. And it doesn't show actually show here, but what shows up in the box is either a, a check mark or an X for them, whether or not they get it right or wrong. Uh, and my slide is stuck here. Oh, and here's just a comparison of something called the reverse visually guided reaching task, where it's similar to visually guided reaching, but we actually invert the axis by 180 degrees. Um, so it adds a little bit of uh, executive control um, on top of it. On the left is uh, somebody who's neurologically intact, and on the right is somebody who's struggling. So this is actually one of my post-cardiac arrest survivors. So in the cohort that we did, uh, we can tell you a little bit about them. I, I tell my students all the time, one of the worst things you can show in a presentation is a, is a slide like this. Uh, but I can tell you, this is sort of what our patient cohort looked like. We had uh, almost 50 people. The mean age was 65. The majority was uh, male and Caucasian. The diabetes and hypertension were the main causes of CKD, uh, and they were uh, stage four and stage five. Uh, and is fairly typical for our Kingston uh, community. At least 50% of them had either university or college degrees. So this is the Kinarm tasks, and shown in the red line is everything below the red line would be considered normal. Uh, everything above the red line is is con uh, is uh, considered Im impaired, and this is essentially a Z score uh, for the patients. So you can see lots and lots of people are a long way away from, from their age, sex, and handed uh, match uh, uh, cohort, you know, getting as high as, you know, six or almost even eight standard deviations away from their, their normal control. So we are able to quantify impairments a lot across numerous domains, including the perceptual motor domain, complex attention, and, and executive function. Uh, and using these uh, robotic tools, we actually characterize almost uh, double the number of patients as, as impaired uh, uh, compared to uh, conventional neuropsychological testing. And this is just an example of how people performed uh, on, uh, this, on one of the hand tracing tasks. 
This is the visually guided reaching in a control patient, their path as they go out towards the target and then come back in again. This is an example of somebody with some mild impairment. Again, you can see they have a little bit of tremor and difficulties going back uh, out towards the target and then back in again. Uh, and then this is somebody who's really quite impaired, again, almost like a random trajectory to, to the target and back again. So what we found is that uh, performance was worse in males uh, and it was uh, worse in people with lower levels of education. Uh, and interestingly, in our co cohort, there are uh, things that weren't associated with the performance were a history of hypertension or diabetes. It wasn't actually related to the, the GFR uh, or the history of coronary artery disease. So this is where we're at now. So I think I've hopefully I've convinced you the cognitive impairment is common in individuals with in, in, in individual CKD. The majority of the studies in this area have relied on dementia screening tools such as the MMSC, where the scores are lower than controls but still above the cutoff dementia. Uh, and robotic technology can use to, be used to quantify impairments, uh, particularly in the perceptual motor and executive domains. So the other questions, so we've talked quite a bit about uh, CKD, and the other question is, are, are there any neurological consequences of a single episode of acute kidney injury? Uh, and again, this is work that was done by uh, uh, Jessica Vanderlinden in combination with Sam Silver, who runs the AKI clinic here. Uh, and really what we wanted to do is compare uh, neurocognitive performance both on standard pen and paper cognitive testing as well as robotic uh, testing. Uh, and what we needed for this group was an active control group. So people who had uh, similar vascular risk factors uh, uh, but didn't have any history of chronic kidney disease. So as I told you, I, one of the cohorts I look at are people both before and after cardiac surgery. Uh, so we used our pre-op cardiac surgery cohorts uh, who were already matched for the vascular risk factors, uh, but didn't have any uh, history uh, or, or kidney disease. So this is a, an example of the, the, the patients that, that, that we had. Again, we were looking at both a clinical assessment with a pen and paper test, as well as a robotic assessment. Uh, we looked at these patients on average about seven months after their uh, admission uh, for the acute kidney injury. 60% uh, of these people uh, required uh, dialysis for the AKI. And similar to what we found before is that using these pen and paper tests for, for uh, uh, assessing cognition, very few of these people were actually uh, categorized as cognitively impaired. Uh, but if we use our robotic uh, tests, we found almost 50% uh, of these AKI, AKI survivors were uh, deemed as uh, impaired uh, compared to much lower numbers of our active control group. So again, even after a single episode of, of acute kidney injury, um, uh, patients can have quite profound cognitive impairment. Um, what we found is when we looked at these patients at their initial assessment compared to their, their follow-up assessment, most of these impairments were detected at their initial assessment, uh, and there was no a significant difference uh, at their, their follow-up assessment, suggesting that maybe over time uh, these patients can improve. So these are some of the differences in the arm position matching test. So again, some proprioceptive defects uh, noted in patients after their acute ki kidney injury, as well as in the visually guided reaching and reverse visually guided reaching task. So the other question is whether or not uh, or how these neurocognitive impairments compare between both acute and chronic kidney disease. So this is, again, some wonderful work that was done by Tasha Jawa. She's uh, in the MD-PhD program uh, comparing like uh, how people did after acute kidney injury versus the chronic kidney disease cohort that we had. And interestingly, we found in the uh, AKI group, uh, their performance was actually worse uh, than it was in, in, in compared to patients uh, with stage three, four, or five uh, um, uh, kidney disease uh, on the re reverse visually guided reaching task. So again, we know that perceptual motor and executive impairments are common in individuals with CKD, CKD as well as after a single episode of AKI. And after AKI, these deficits may improve for some, but not all patients. And surprisingly for us, uh, the patients with acute kidney injury, the neurocognitive deficits may be worse than our CKD patients, um, but that can be confounded by the, whatever the diagnosis was that led to AKI. So particularly for our cohort, 50% of our patients with AKI also were admitted to the intensive care unit. And we know that if you are admitted to the ICU, uh, you can certainly have long-term cognitive impairment as well. 
So we've talked about actually describing the problem quite a bit, um, but I, what I want to shift gears and talk about what are the potential mechanisms underlying these neurocognitive impairments in patients with kidney disease. And we know patients with chronic kidney disease have a tremendous amount of neuropathological findings. Uh, there's a lovely study um, uh, looking at the neuropathological fi findings in patients with CKD. We know lacunar infarcts were common. They were described in about 55%. Uh, there's lots of vascular disease, um, both arterial and uh, arteriolar sclerosis were found in three quarters of patients. So we know that vascular, cerebral vascular disease is really common. There's a study published a couple of years ago looking at white matter changes and ventricular enlargement in, in patients uh, with chronic kidney disease. And this is an example of one of their patients at baseline. Again, you can see all this white matter pathology uh, and the ventricles are a little bit bigger than what you might expect. And at three three years, uh, their follow up on their MRI, you can see the white matter pathology is uh, quite a bit more pronounced. Um, they also looked at markers of um, uh, axonal or microstructural disease using fractional anisotropy, uh, and found that that was increased as well. So it's not just uh, ischemic disease. Uh, patients with uh, chronic kidney disease are also prone to microbleeds. And again, this is a, a, a study looking at uh, uh, the progression of microbleeds in patients with chronic kidney disease. Um, this is an example of one of the bleeds that you see uh, here, uh, just a little black dot on their susceptibility weighting Im imaging. And this is when they were looking at these patients in, in follow-up, um, the patients with uh, who were on dialysis, you know, some of them, uh, they they had seven bleeds at the at baseline and at follow up, they still had seven. Some of them actually doubled the number of micro bleeds that they had. Uh, some of them had just had one additional one. They had one patient in their cohort who had zero micro bleeds at, at baseline and 268 on their follow up uh, scan. So again, this is a progression of, of both the ischemic burden as well as the, the um, micro bleeds that you can see on MR. Uh, this is a pretty interesting uh, animal study looking at the uh, uh, presence of microbleeds as well in an two different animal models uh, of chronic kidney disease. And interestingly, uh, not only uh, do you have an increase in the amount of microbleeds in these uh, CKD uh, animals, if you give these uh, animals an episode of sepsis mimicked by administration of LPS, you had a dramatic increase uh, in the amount of microbleeds that they had, uh, suggesting that you know uh, having an additional you know uh, infectious or, or, or septic type episode uh, on top of a, a, a history of CKD can be really destructive to the to the brain. Um, Another interesting study looking at markers of axonal disease, uh, looking at neurofilament light chain in patients uh, with end-stage kidney disease. Uh, they found they had 43 patients uh, with end-stage kidney disease without cognitive impairment and 24 patients uh, uh, with cognitive impairment. And they found the patients uh, without the cognitive impairment had significantly less neurofilament light chain uh, in, in, their, in their serum. Again, and this is a marker of axonal damage. So we know that uh, vascular disease is common, both ischemic as well as a hemorrhagic burden. Uh, animal models suggest maybe this is made worse uh, in episodes of sepsis or infections. Uh, and certainly there's markers of axonal damage as well. So one of the last questions I, I wanted to ask you is whether or not, you know, that the treatment for end-stage kidney disease may actually worsen cognitive impairment. And this is a large population-based uh, study uh, looking at the trajectory of executive function in, in patients. Uh, this is a patient with chronic kidney disease uh, it, who haven't required hemodialysis uh, throughout their, their, their throughout the two-year course of the study. And you can see the uh, fairly uh, level degree of, of cognition. For patients that required the initiation of hemodialysis uh, during the two-year study period, you see a, a very rapid and robust drop-off of their cognitive performance, as well as uh, compared to people who didn't require dialysis, almost an acceler accelerated rate of cognitive decline. Uh, patients who are on hemodialysis um, uh, before the initiation of the study, again, they start off uh, significantly worse than people who are not on hemodialysis. And again, they have this uh, progression in terms of their cognitive impairment. I think it's a really interesting study. It's a population-based study. Uh, I think one of the things we've learned, though, is that screening tools uh, for cognition um, 
you know, they, they just they, they may not capture the, the, the degree or the actual severity of how a severe cognitive impairment would be. Again, so the study is really important, but again, they, they, they used the, like a telephone screening test uh, for cognition. When we look at the degree of uh, what actually happens uh, during hemodialysis and what might actually be happening to the brain, there's a really interesting study looking at interdialytic hypotension and its uh, relationship with cognitive, cognitive function, as well as uh, uh, MRI markers of axonal damage. So they looked at the association between episodes of hypotension uh, during dialysis, defined as a systolic blood pressure less than 90, or less than uh, 20 millimeters off the baseline, and correlated that <clears throat> with structural changes on their MRI and, and cognitive impairment. And what they found is even after controlling for really important uh, covariates such as the history of hypertension, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease, these episodes of interdialytic hypertension were associated with decreased white matter volume, decreased hippocampal thickness, and lower scores on the MMSE. But the thing is, like, that's not supposed to happen, right? Like, we all know that if your blood pressure goes low, uh, even like 20 millimeters of mercury less, you shouldn't have cerebral ischemia. Uh, and we all learned this in medical school. This is a typical um, um, cerebral autoregulation curve where you should have <clears throat> normal cerebral perfusion between a wide range of mean arterial pressures uh, between 60 and 140 millimeters of mercury. And this is all regulated by the fact that at lower levels of blood pressure, your uh, cerebral vascular uh, system tends to dilate to improve your cerebral blood flow. And as your blood pressure increases, your cerebral vasculature um, uh, constricts uh, to make sure that you don't develop cerebral edema. And it's only really at the extremes of this uh, that you have a uh, pressure passive um, uh, system where if your blood pressure goes low, uh, your cerebral perfusion decreases as, as well. But the, so the real question is whether or not cerebral autoregulation is preserved in patients with end-stage kidney disease. Uh, and this is some really fascinating work, again, uh, done by one of my colleagues, Mar uh, Marat Slesarev uh, and Chris McIntyre, uh, looking at whether or not cerebral autoregulation is preserved in patients uh, uh, who are on dialysis. And they do this with an inhalation of, of, of CO2 uh, to see if they can get the, the cerebral blood vessels uh, to dilate and improve the cerebral blood flow. And they did this, it's a small study looking at 17 healthy controls, um, patients who had chronic kidney disease, and eight patients who were on hemodialysis. And what they found, again, this is looking at the change in the cerebral blood flow um, with the inhalation of carbon dioxide. So you would expect as your CO2 goes up that your cerebral blood vessels should dilate and you should have an increase in cerebral blood flow. And what they found is that in controls in patients with CKD, they actually had a fairly typical response. However, in patients who are on hemodialysis, this uh, uh, cerebral dilation in response to CO2 was really blunted. And what these authors thought is that these cerebral arteries are, if they're unable to dilate in response to CO2, they may not be able to dilate in response to low blood pressure. So during periods of hypotension during dialysis, this may cause repetitive ischemia in vulnerable areas. Um, and they weren't quite sure why it was only happening in, in hemodialysis patients. Um, so we also study this in our cohort of patients. Uh, we use uh, near-infrared spectroscopy to measure um, uh, uh, cerebral oxygenation. And we did this in a, co a small cohort of patients undergoing hemodialysis, uh, looking at them over a really long period of time. And again, during, in, this, uh, uh, in this range between about 60 and 140, as your blood pressure goes up, your cerebral autoregulation should stay the same. So there really should be no correlation between these two variables. Uh, but if you have impaired cerebral autoregulation, you would expect a positive correlation. And in fact, what we found was actually a very strong positive correlation between cerebral autoregulation and mean arterial pressure. Again, in our very small cohort, suggesting that again, in patients on hemodialysis may actually have impaired cerebral autoregulation. And this is some recent work that is fresh off the press, uh, and, um, just published uh, a couple of weeks ago, again, by uh, Chris McIntyre, looking at, uh, look, again, a really cool study looking at MRI in patients uh, pre-dialysis 
and uh, one hour before the end of their dialysis uh, period, and looking at MR markers of cerebral edema uh, and uh, tractog uh, tractography, looking at uh, exonal uh, uh, damage as well. And what they found is that during dialysis, you had markers of um, uh, cytotoxic edema. So you would actually get an increase in gray matter volume and an increase in white matter volume with a corresponding decrease in CSF volume, all suggesting that you know three hours into um, a, a single episode of, of hemodialysis uh, that you're causing some cerebral uh, and cytotoxic edema. They also looked at uh, markers of, of uh, axonal damage uh, uh, and axonal stress, such as fractional anisotropia and, and anisotropy and mean diffus diffusivity. Uh, and again, found that these markers were, were elevated, suggesting uh, of axonal damage uh, within three hours of a single episode of hemodialysis. So this is sort of where we are right now. You know, there's lots of shared risk factors between cerebral vascular disease and kidney disease. Uh, patients uh, who develop, you know, you know, vascular cognitive impairment, and people who have developed CKD, they all have hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, and smoking is a huge risk factor for for both of these diseases. So there's some. Additional deleterious effects of CKD, such as persistent inflammation, chronic uremia, and arterial stiffness, which may further exacerbate uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the cognitive impairment that we see in these cohorts of patients. And then there's this recent work suggesting that there's some further detrimental effects of hemodialysis, such as recurrent hypoperfusion, white matter damage, exonal loss, and disturbed cerebral autoregulation. So the question is then, like, where do we go from here? We've identified the problem. We've got some hypotheses as to what the underlying pathophysiology can be. There's really not that much we can do. We can, you know, we can you know, work, uh, you know, from a public health point of view to see if we can uh, optimize some of the risk factors. I certainly know for uh, vascular cognitive impairment, one of the most important things that we can do is, you know, make sure that the uh, uh, the baseline risk factors are, are as optimized as possible. Uh, so doing uh, counseling on smoking cessation to make sure uh, blood pressure is in the target range. And the other question is, can we change the way that we dialyze patients uh, to cause less axonal damage and cause less cytotoxic edema? And again, this is some uh, really cool work that's just uh, just sort of you know coming out right now, uh, looking at using uh, you know hy uh, hypothermic or cold diacylate to see if that causes uh, less uh, strubovascular stress. Uh, and they looked at these patients uh, over one year again in a very small um, uh, small study. And this is looking at the number of hypotensive episodes that patients had. Uh, and again, this is kind of a, a funny graph to look at, but this the red mark, these are the patients who had the the, the normal thermic uh, diacylate at baseline and the patients who had the hypothermic uh, diacylate at baseline. So you can see this is uh, close to the same. Although when you look at the, the number of hypotensive uh, events that patients had uh, at, one, at one year, it was much higher in the patients with the normal thermic diacylate than it was in the patient with the, the hypothermic diacylate. They also looked at markers of axonal stress. And again, the baseline was pr pretty comparable between the patients uh, with the normal thermic uh, diacylate versus the hypothermic diacylate. But at one year later, the patients with the normal thermic diacylate had increased markers of axonal stress uh, compared to the patients with the hypothermic diacylate. Uh, and again, another smaller study looking uh, at, at, at uh, conventional diacylate temperature versus cooler diacylate temperature. Um, looking at the number of hypotensive events, and certainly with the cooler diacylate temperature, there was a decrease um, uh, in in the uh, in the number of hypotensive events that patients had during dialysis. In our own work, what we're doing is we're looking at the um, neurocognitive consequences of both uh, hemodialysis and uh, C CRRT in the in the intensive care unit. So these are patients who are admitted to the ICU with acute kidney injury requiring renal replacement therapy. And we put an oxygen sensor uh, on their, their, their forehead to measure cerebral oxygenation, uh, both during uh, CRRT and intermittent hemodialysis. And then we'll bring these patients back at, at three months to look at their cognitive uh, the kin arm, uh, and we'll bring them back for MRI as well. Uh, 
And we'll look at them 12 months later as well, repeating these assessments. I got to tell you, this has been a really tough study to get off the ground because uh, this is a really, really sick cohort of patients. Uh, of the uh, 13 patients that we've enrolled so far, uh, only two of them have been able to come back at three months. We've had eight of them die, and the other ones are still so, so sick that they can't possibly participate in either the MRI or the cognitive testing. So my overall conclusions, again, I hopefully I've convinced you that cognitive dysfunction is really common in patients with CKD, particularly for those who are on hemodialysis. This has really important implications for driving safety and adherence to medications and dietary restrictions. And I think we're in an era of really cool, like, you know, hypothesis generating work and some early interventional studies about the cognitive consequences of, of kidney disease. And again, just sort of finishing off where I started, you know, thanking all the people who contributed to this work. Again, much of the early work was done by uh, Jessica, who did her finished her PhD with me a couple of years ago. Uh, Tasha, who's really kind of picked up the reins. My nephrology colleagues here, uh, Sam Silver, Rachel Holden, and Khaled uh, Shamsuddin, uh, and then my neuroscientist colleague, uh, Steve Scott. Uh, and if you one uh, one other little plug, yeah, I, I play in a band uh, here in Kingston, and and Rachel's our lead guitarist. Uh, so if you know Rachel from a, a nephrology point of view, you may not know her rip-roaring, awesome uh, lead guitarist. And with that, I'll finish off there. Thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. I thought I recognized skeptical uh, ID as well in the band, if not, if I'm not wrong. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any any questions from uh, the audience? Please raise your hand and mute yourself. Uh, yeah, Ted. Uh, thanks for a great talk, Gord. Um, one thing, I guess, in terms of things that are potentially modifiable, um, is there much been looked at for sort of longer term cognitive impairment and uh, fluid management strategies, like how how like with diuretics and otherwise? Oh, uh, that's a really great question. I, I'm really not sure, actually, uh, in in terms of like trying to optimize you know, diuresis so they're not undergoing these massive fluid shifts uh, you know, three times a week in the dialysis unit. Exactly. Like I think because yeah. I sometimes wonder, you know, I think like the, the sort of wet dry pendulum of things has definitely swung back hard towards dry and there's lots of good observational evidence to support that strategy. But at the same time, you know, the outcomes that we look at are pretty short term. And you wonder, like, you know, you get a patient off event sooner, but what's the risk of cognitive impairment or long term kidney dysfunction when you take that more aggressive strategy? And I don't I don't you know, there's obviously a trade off there that's, you know, I think we're erring on one side and which is fine. I don't think we know better, but interesting to know longer term yeah. how that plays out. No, I, and I completely agree, actually. So, you know, capturing all of that data is part of yeah, Tasha's incognito AKI study about the, the fluid removal strategy. So we'll be able to capture that data. But like I said, this has been a really, really right. tough, tough study to, to recruit to because they're just such a sick, vulnerable cohort of patients. Thanks. Uh, Peter? Yeah, so um, yeah, uh, off topic about AKI, but your initial case was the guy with CKD and postural hypotension, uh, a pretty garden variety case that we see in clinic. Um, you know, I guess when they did sprint trial of aggressive blood pressure control, including old people, I thought they would cause a whole lot more hypotension on standing, and we certainly see lots of those. And a bunch of the people I see who are hypotensive when they stand up seem to be cognitively not all there, not that I do any formal testing. So do we know anything about aggressiveness of blood pressure control and induction of postural hypotension and what it might be doing to the brain? Uh, so the short answer is no. Um, so one of the problems with all of these studies is that you know cogn cognition is rarely an outcome that's ever studied. Um, and if it is studied, they, they're using really, really coarse tools uh, that are really not designed to pick up really, really uh, important degrees of cognitive impairment. Like even in our own study, like 
we didn't use the MMSE, we use the R bands, which is like a 20 minute version, like more expanded version of that. Uh, and we only identified like, like a small percentage of uh, patients as cognitively impaired. Whereas doing some really robust, you know, quantitative metrics of cognition, like more than 50% of these, uh, well, 50% of the cohort uh, had, had at least some degree of cognitive impairment. Um, so yeah, it's sort of a, a pet peeve of mine that you got like the outcomes for all of these studies are, are rarely anything to do uh, with with cognition, um, and if it is, it's usually like um, like buried in into like the SF thirty six in terms of the, the the quality of life metrics, which is really not designed to to look at cognition per se. And of course, sprint uh, follow up studies did suggest there was less dementia not more so i guess overall blood pressure control is good as no i missed the comments yeah yeah so that uh, he's talking about the sprint mind sub study and and then um it was underpowered uh, so it did not show a decrease in dementia it suggested something decrease in the mci mild cognitive impairment or something and and yeah there was a lot of controversy about the validity of those findings because the study was stopped early etc cetera, etc cetera. On the same topic, there's another question in the comments from Dr. Zimmerman on uh, statins. Uh, is there any evidence that statins increase microbleeds? Is that uh, a concern? Oh, that, again, you're asking lots of really great questions. I don't know the answer to. I think, um, like, I there's always this fear of, of statins and intracerebral hemorrhage, and I think that's largely driven by the Sparkle trial, right, from back in the 90s, uh, where we were looking at secondary stroke prevention, uh, and there was increased uh, hemorrhage in, in the, the high-dose statin group uh, compared to the placebo group. And I think, like, that study is now, like, getting on 30 years old, and, and I think, you know, like, people, like, it's a really different cohort of people now than than it was back in the 80s and 90s when the Sparkle trial w w was recruiting. Um, and certainly, I don't have any clinical concerns about the increased rate of microbleeds with the use of statins. Um, I think you know controlling you know the all these vascular risk factors are probably more important than any sort of you know, you know hypothetical risk of increasing uh, microbleeds. Excellent, thank you. Uh, the conference room. Yeah, so a couple of things. I guess before we all start getting asked to lower our dial state temperature, um, and my colleague answer this better than me, but there was a very large pragmatic trial in Ontario, my temp, that was looking at temperature and dialysis. And if I remember correctly, because I don't pay that much attention to dialysis literature, I don't think it showed a difference. Am I right, you guys? Yeah. Now, I don't, I mean, it was looking at uh, hypotension, the right, uh, not, and there was no, I'm not suggesting that there was any neurocognitive testing as part of that, but as far as hypotension goes, it, it didn't really show uh, a difference. Um, all right. Um, and then I think, you know, the other question is one of the challenges that we have in looking at comparators of CKD and different dialysis treatments is, first of all, our patients don't it's not linear. They go through potentially multiple treatments. And second, there's a huge selection bias between who gets started on hemodialysis, who gets PD, and who ultimately gets a transplant. Um, so it would be uh, interesting. I don't the studies that you've done have uh, looked at patients who, uh, over time, like, is there any change as they move from one modality to another? And it'd be interesting to look at something like nocturnal dialysis, where, you know, it's an eight-hour treatment, so both the you know, urea clearance, and maybe that has something to do with cerebral edema or, or the slower fluid removal, whether that in any way protects against some of these bad effects of hemodialysis. Have you looked at people moving from one modality to another? I guess that's my first question. Yeah, so that's actually one of the central hypotheses of the in our incognito AKI study. So we can look at changes in cerebral perfusion and cerebral odd regulation uh, between uh, CRT and and IHD. Uh, but you hit the nail on the head. Like it's totally confounded by the fact that really, really sick people on tons of pressors get C CRT, and once they're hemodynamically stable, we switch them over to IHD. 
Uh, and I have yet to be able to figure out a way of getting out of that uh, that that confounding uh, factors. Um, what you've already also pointed out is like looking at you know the cognitive impairment between you know I IHD peritoneal dialysis and post transplant. There's almost like a stepwise approach between the most severe cognitive impairment to some mild cognitive impairment, which is completely confounded by the fact that people who are eligible for transplant are totally different from the people who you know end up staying on IHD. Um, so yeah. It's 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 really challenging for us, and I haven't figured out how to get around that. Yeah, so one of the ways you know it's some people get around is is, is people who are eligible for transplant on hemodialysis versus people who had a transplant is one way. Some we we've looked at some of it, but it's still not perfect. There's still something different there, probably. Yeah. Um, just just one thing I think is it doesn't help in critically ill patients, but sort of like one way to get around that a bit in the sort of maintenance population is uh, potentially looking at PD, like peritoneal dialysis separately, because, you know, we, we know there's more rapid with intermittent hemodialysis, but if you took, if you're able to take patients who like, it's it's different populations, unfortunately, because, you know, you often it's healthier people starting PD. But if you looked at people starting from like an MCK clinic, like an advanced CKD clinic, and starting on PD versus starting on hemo with a fistula, which implies they're a little bit healthier, that would be like an interesting comparison because you might get uh, some sense of like, what's the purely hemodynamic effect? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, and certainly when Jessica was here, she was actively recruiting patients uh, from Khaled's clinic, both the PD and the IHD patients. Um, but uh, that's sort of fallen off uh, since she's finished, but maybe we need to get somebody back on that project, getting them back in the clinic and recruiting these cohorts. Can I ask how many PD patients did, were you able to get in? Not many, like uh, less than 10 probably. So not enough to really make any like meaningful conclusions. What was the, do you know what the big barrier was to them enrolling or? So uh, honestly, the biggest barriers, uh, we started this study at the same time. There's a huge push for like home HD uh, here in Kingston. Um, so that seemed to be more the focus of the dialysis modality than anything else. And if I could Thanks. wrap up with the one, if, if there are no other questions, I can ask one. Uh, it, is that one of my cynical takes is, you know, how much of the uh, effect uh, is because of the dialytic modality versus the fact that, you know, this is a lifetime of badness that they have accumulated. I mean, you show that with EGFR, there is something. And even in the pre-dialysis patient, there is some, you know, there are cognitive uh, uh, issues that are going on. Um, is that, do you have a sense of how much is, you know, fixable by uh, tweaking dialysis and, and the stuff we do on dialysis versus what's just happened in the milieu uh, with progression of CKD or their underlying comorbid conditions and age and all that? Yeah, so I, I think the best data is from that UK uh, cohort of when they looked at patients uh, over a two year period of time, looking at you know people never requiring dialysis, people who started dialysis halfway through the study and the people who um, were on dialysis at the beginning of the study. And there's like a huge step uh, in that cohort of patients uh, who uh, who started dialysis in the middle of the two year study. So and I, I don't think like if so I, I suspect that it's probably contributing. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I get, I'm a huge fan of Chris's work uh, out in London. And it's like mortifying to think that you, like like three hours into like a single run of the HD, that there's like cytotoxic edema and axonal stress, the same sort of axonal stress that you see in, a, in, in acute like infarction. Um, so, I would think that if we can figure out better ways to dialyze people that's not causing cytotoxic edema and, and white matter stress, uh, probably their their cognition will be a little bit preserved. But I'm also appreciative of your skepticism that it's uh, they're a really frail cohort of pe uh, people. Like that's why I started off the talk with a picture of the parking garage. Uh, like everybody's cars are all banged. Like you, you, you guys probably walk through the your your dialysis parking garage too. Like look at their bumpers; they're all smashed up. Um, so yeah, they're, they're a pretty frail cohort. My, like Steve Scott and his entire Kinarn team, they said like, 
they perform the worst out of any cohort they've ever studied. And, and they study like people with Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease. So their 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 you know their cognitive impairment is really, really profound. Um, but I, I think there's an opportunity to to intervene. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was, you know, just trying to be a devil's advocate. I agree, you know, when we find out some of the people who are still driving, it's like, oh no, you know, when the nurses tell us this patient is driving and it's uh it's yeah. Uh that explains why there's an accident in the Riverside parking lot like every every two days. <laughs> yeah. Um, but on that note, thank you for that uh, wonderful uh, presentation. The, the the pictures and the videos were really, really cool. Uh the uh, for the audience, the um, uh, talk will be available uh, on our YouTube channel if you missed anything, and you will be getting an email with a link to the um um uh, evaluation so please can complete the survey when you get that thanks god and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to host you in person sometime in the future oh it was absolutely my my pleasure as you're probably picking up I, I, i'll talk about you know cognition till i'm blue in the face i really appreciate the opportunity to share some of the work that we're doing and and to talk about a, a topic that's really close to my heart awesome thank you okay take care everybody thanks Carl.